Welcome everyone. Uh, great to see you all today and I appreciate you coming for our CERTL network presentation on how completing a TAR project impacted my career. And we have reflections from some great uh, four different CERTL TAR alumni. And I'm really eager to hear them, hear their comments. Uh, my name is Robin Greenlaw. I'm the assistant director of CERTL, which is, if you don't know, the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning. Uh, it's an organization in the US and Canada that's working to make the sciences more diverse by changing how they're taught. And our, our focus is supporting future faculty, so grad students and postdocs, uh, to help develop more inclusive and evidence-based methods for teaching and learning. Most of you, I suspect, are familiar with teaching as research, or we refer to it as TAR, T-A-R, uh, which is an approach to rigorously examining a teaching technique uh, by using the research skills that many of us have in our disciplines, uh, just to determine the effectiveness of the practice. Some TAR projects can be quite large and, and move into publishable levels, and others are really part of examining your own practice to decide if something is really working as you're expecting it to and is, is, is achieving the learning outcomes that you're hoping for. So we're gonna hear from four people today who completed their TR projects, but we're not gonna hear about the project itself very much. Um, I suspect each of them will, will wanna share a little bit about it, but particularly about how it impacted their career trajectory and their choices and where they are now. So thank you for that introduction and okay, I should be able to move that slide forward, but it's not moving. Let me update so, that setting. Sorry, Robin. It's okay. Now you should be able to do it. Excellent. So the first off, if you all, we're going to just do a quick poll to find out a little bit more about who's in this room and how familiar you are with teaching as research so that I have some sense who's in here. Okay, watching the results come in. It looks like actually almost 60% of you are here to learn more about TR, which is great. Um, a few of you will mentor or advise TR projects. Some of you have presented or published already. Um, and some of you are working on them right now or planning. But it looks like the vast majority are here to learn more about it. And I really, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you've done that because I'm glad to have you here. One of the things that uh, I think is overlooked often with TAR projects is the how much they can be leveraged in your career and how much they can be leveraged professionally. There, there's all sorts of other reasons to do them and it's, there's lots of things to learn about kind of how they're done and, and how you come up with a question and, and how you analyze data and all of that. But I really think we sometimes don't talk as much as we might about how you can really leverage it professionally. Uh, so that's what we're gonna hear about today. we go. Uh, so our panelists today, uh, you can see here, Asiel Bala from Lafayette College, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Liz Crofton, an assistant professor of neuroscience at Emanuel College in Boston. Uh, John Hickey, who's thankfully coming from his lab. Thank you so much, John, for jumping out in the middle of juggling multiple experiments today, it sounds like. Uh, postdoc at, in microbiology and immunology at Stanford University and Lindsay Avery, uh, Penn Port postdoc at University of Pennsylvania, who is also jumping out from the middle of a lab day, it sounds like, but managed to snag an office. So those are our four panelists. And without uh, much more, what I'd like to do is, is have Asil Bala start to talk to us a little bit about her, her uh, journey with TAR and her career. So it's all yours, Asil. Hi, thanks so much, Robin. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Asil Bella. Uh, I am a chemical engineer or an assistant professor in chemical engineering. Uh, I started off uh, with my bachelor's degree from Sultan Qaboos University in Oman. I was living at, there at the time, so that's where I got my undergraduate. Um, and then it, I got a PhD in chemical engineering from Michigan State University in 2018, which was really my first um, time trying to do a TAR project, learning about TAR, 
um, in, in any sort of serious way. I took a course in engineering education um, that was more geared towards uh, preparing you to teach in the classroom rather than to do uh, a research in teaching. Um, but that's how I first learned about TAR even being a possibility. And uh, through that class, I decided to apply to the, post, the FAST program, which, is, which stands for Future Academic Scholars in Teaching. Um, it is a uh, program that we have at MSU that is uh, geared towards first developing you as an, as a, um, as an instructor and a teacher, uh, but secondly, of course, to introduce you to TAR, allow you to, to do a TAR project um, and to uh, kind of gather results and, and analyze them. And so I was a FAST scholar from uh, in the year 2016 to 2017. And then I was lucky enough the following year to be um, selected to be the graduate student representative or the peer mentor, uh, basically the person who has done a TAR project in the previous year um, and kind of serves on the steering committee to uh, help guide the other FAST fellows of that year through their TAR project. Um, and so I did that for from 2017 to 2018. Um, through my TAR project, I was able to uh, present my work at a couple of different conferences. Uh, and one of those conferences was the uh, AICHE. So for us, it's like the big one for chemical engineers. Um, and they had a session on meeting the faculty candidates. So when I was a PhD candidate and I was looking at jobs, um, I presented there sort of to uh, talk about what I wanted in a, in a position that I wanted it to be in a teaching intensive institution. Um, that I wanted uh, teaching to be valued at least as much as research, uh, if not a little bit more. Um, and I presented on, amongst other things, including my disciplinary research, my TAR research project. Um, and uh, I think, and according to the person who, uh, who is now my department head, uh, the TAR part was really the part that caught their attention because uh, Lafayette College is a very small liberal arts school with an engineering program, which you don't hear about a lot. Um, those two don't tend to go together, uh, but they do have, they are liberal arts college with an engineering program. And so because of their emphasis on teaching, um, they like the fact that I thought of it as being equal to research, uh, to disciplinary research. Um, and so I joined Lafayette College in fall 2018, right after I graduated, and I've been here ever since. Um, I'm an assistant professor here um, on the tenure track line, and I am still here uh, kind of in the same position. Um, a little bit about my TAR project. I don't think that's there we go. For some reason I'm not, ah, okay. Um, so uh, a little bit about my uh, TAR research project. I, uh, as I mentioned, I'm in chemical engineering um, and I am, my research area was thermodynamics specifically, uh, which is a fancy word of saying, how does heat and, and how does temperature and pressure affect all of the different uh, things that molecule, molecules can do? And how does that represent itself in macroscopic things? Um, and so I, at the time, was uh, TAing for the thermodynamics professor, who was also my, uh, my primary investigator in graduate school. And so I really wanted my TAR project to be in that area. And so my project had two primary objectives. The first was to identify common misconceptions about internal energy. It's kind of a, just a concept that we saw students really struggle with, primarily because it was so abstract. Um, and difficult to kind of uh, visualize sometimes. Um, and so we wanted to see what the common misconceptions were that the students were having, uh, and also measure the effects of cooperative learning, which is something that I was learning through FAST and through the courses that I, the, the course that I took in engineering education um, on student performance. Now the, the course was normally very lecture-based and uh, the assessment at the end kind of just picked up on what the students were doing uh, in the lecture or what they got in the homeworks. Uh, but we thought that including something that was slightly more interactive, slightly more active uh, in general would, would maybe help that. And we found that it did indeed help. But the exercise was actually quite simple. It wasn't a extremely novel. I, it was just a simple application where um, we had the students in the class work through a worksheet, uh, which kind of related all these abstract concepts to things they sort of understood, heat and temperature and what happens when you heat something up. Um, and we had them do the worksheet alone and then uh, get into teams where they discussed um, their, their solutions and then they had to reach a consensus. We basically told them that we were only grading one team, one team member's answers uh, to sort of force that aspect of interdependence and having them uh, actually you know, uh, be involved and interested in the actual solution. 
Um, and so this is just a sample question that was in that um, that it was in that worksheet. And then we looked at what the results were and we compared it to previous years where they really did not have that interactive um, aspect. And so we found that it was actually quite helpful, not only in um, them understanding the concepts, but also then maintaining that understanding and, and recalling it in the final exam uh, assessment. So that was my project. It wasn't extremely um, high tech. It was uh, kind of an application of something that we know to be true as people who uh, think about teaching all the time. Uh, but it was mostly just applying it and seeing the effects of it that was um, important to me. Um, and I would say primarily it was important so that I wanted to know just as an instructor, because I knew that I was going to be teaching thermodynamics in my life, which I am. So that's uh, so that was correct. Um, but also because I wanted the experience of doing teaching as research. I wanted to go through the IRB process. I wanted to know all of the ins and outs of it because I do want to do that kind of research again later in my life. Um, so yeah, so why I did a TAR project to experience researchers outside my disciplinary field. I love it and I enjoy doing research in my disciplinary field, but I thought that this was something else that I would be interested in. And I was, um, I was right. I did really enjoy doing a pedagogical research um, and to learn more about teaching as a profession. Uh, I think when I first started doing um, FAST and when I first started that course on, an engin on engineering education, I was mostly just trying to learn about what it would be like, not necessarily knowing if it was something I wanted to do. Um, and so it did help me identify that this is something that I was interested in. And I was lucky enough to present the work uh, at the two conferences you see there. Um, and the impact on my career, as you can, as you might have picked up from the story I told earlier, was that it literally helped me get this job because it was on the poster. That's what kind of drew them in, and um, and it helped me get this position because it kind of showed what I was interested in and that and that it aligned with what the college was looking for. Um, so yeah, so that's that's my talk project. Thanks. That's great. Thank you so much, Isabel. I think what we'll probably do is hold questions. Uh, until after we've heard all four presentations, but feel free to jot things down if you want to ask a specific question of someone. Uh, but why don't we move on and we'll hear from Liz, uh, Liz Crofton. And go ahead, take it away, Liz. Yeah, I'm Liz Crofton. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor of neuroscience at Emmanuel College in Boston. Um, and I had the awesome experience to start fall of 2020, so last semester. So it's been a, an interesting transition. Um, I'm gonna try to ignore pandemic related things and just talk in general about my career overall and why I did a TAR project. Um, so my undergrad degree is actually in psychology um, and I knew I wanted to do neuroscience research. We didn't have a neuroscience major, um, but I minored in neuroscience and I really wanted to get that experience. So I went to graduate school in neuroscience um, but my graduate school was at a medical school and we had no undergrads. Um, so I didn't really have that experience to, you know, be able to TA, TA a class. Um, and a lot of psychology graduate students, they do a lot of teaching. And so I knew I would be competing against either biology people or psychology people. And they would probably both have more teaching experience than I had. Because um, I knew I wanted to work at a small liberal arts college, like Asiel was talking about, somewhere that really cares about um, small classroom size, um, being really dedicated to a good educational experience for all of their students. Um, so finishing up my grad work, I knew I needed more teaching experience. And so I applied for the SPIRE program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, so this is a, spe a special postdoc program um, for people that want to get um, teaching experience. So it's basically a normal postdoc research experience and then added on to it a lot of professional development um, and um, a lot of training in like college education and college teaching um, and also teaching experience. Um, I cannot say enough good stuff about the SPIRE program. So if you're a grad student and you're looking for you know, something similar. There are other programs. Um, this is funded through the National Institute on General Medical Sciences. Um, and Lindsay is also in one of those ERACTA programs also. So I'm sure she'll talk about it. But so all of my career is kind of wrapped up in the SPIRE program and CERTL. So, you know, things definitely overlap with those things. But 
Um, so through the SPIRE program, in addition to my research um, in alcohol, I was also able to be a part-time instructor of biology at the North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is a historically black college in Greensboro. Um, and so I taught two full, um, like two different semesters, one class each, and I was the instructor of record. So if you are interested in a faculty position, I think it really helped me a lot to have that much teaching experience. Um, and so when I was getting ready for my teaching semesters, I really wanted to make sure that um, I was giving the best possible experience for my students and I wanted to be able to apply my research skills to the classroom. And that's kind of the overall goal of any teaching as research project um, is to utilize these evidence-based teaching strategies um, and to apply your research skills to teaching in your classroom. Um, and things that I was specifically interested in is really making sure that my classroom is equitable for all students. Um, so my specific project was doing um, basically a muddiest point activity. So each student, when they walked in, they would get a small note card. And at the end of class, they would have to answer two questions. Usually the first one was like, you know, what are you still confused about from the lesson? And then another question is like, you know, what was the main thing that we talked about or, you know, answer this one question. And so that's how I used um, attendance. I hate like reading roll calls. So that was an easy way for me to get attendance, but I also wanted to make sure I was getting feedback from each and every student um, every single time. You know, some of those students that are more struggling aren't going to want to come to your office hours or don't know to come to your office hours and ask for help. Um, so I really wanted to maximize all of their learning um, and also be reflective about my teaching. So get feedback from them. Like if all of them are saying this part was confusing, then I need to, you know, cover that again um, in the next class. Um, and something that I think is really great about the TAR project is that you can, you know, it it forces you to read about the education literature. Um, you know, we all have those research-based skills, but I didn't really apply those to um, the education literature. And I think that really helped, you know, looking into all the biology education research, which is amazing. Um, there's some neuroscience education research. And I think that really helped me to just read those papers in general, um, but also thinking about my teaching as an iterative process. So, you know, find something that you think will be helpful, some sort of intervention, um, and then assess its effectiveness with data. Don't just be like, oh, I think that worked well, or I don't think that worked well. Like, you know, we're scientists, collect data about it. Um, and then because I wanted to be faculty, you know, you don't usually teach one class and then you never teach it again. You're usually teaching the same course over and over again. Um, so thinking about it as an iterative process, I think has been helpful. Um, and I wanted to apply these skills throughout my career. Um, so some of the impacts, uh, I think in general, it really helped to, you know, aside from the SPIRE program, I was able to meet some graduate students at UNC who are, you know, passionate about education. Um, so I think that learning community, just being able to meet other people in the SOTO program um, and talk to them and hear their ideas, I think has been helpful. Um, I also presented my TAR project um, at the ERECTA conference, which is like the umbrella program for SPIRE. Um, and I also was able to present it at the one of the CERTL all network events for my TAR project. So, you know, specific things on my CV, lines on my CV to show, you know, how, how important I think education is. Um, and in general, it really helped with my job applications. I was able to talk about my TAR project. Um, I think it really helped to have like specific examples. Like, you know, I told them about my project and what it was and, you know, kind of the impacts. And I think being able to frame it in that more research style um, really shows that I'm passionate about that. Um, and uh, something that I didn't really think about until this year is that as a faculty member, you have to assess your own teaching every year. So I, you know, in a couple of months, I'm gonna have to write a report about what I did in the classroom, how it affected my students and kind of what I'm gonna do going forward, how I'm gonna adjust my teaching. Um, and so I think all of these skills can be applied 
in general in your career, even if you don't complete your TAR project, I think just being able to look into it and being able to talk about it in job applications and use those skills going forward has been really helpful. Um, I think that's all my slides. Um, so, you know, definitely we can talk more about um, things in general, um, but those are kind of my, my big takeaways from the TAR project. That's great, Liz. Thanks so much. It's great to hear all the different ways that you that you used your TR experience. So next we hear from John Hickey. John, it's all yours. Uh, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I actually share a lot of similarities to Liz, um, where, um, and I'll kind of just talk about, uh, let's see. So my, but my, my career started out at Johns Hopkins University where I was a PhD student in biomedical engineering. And one cool thing that they have there is this thing called the Teaching Academy. And that's developed by the Center for Educational Resources. And what the, the goal of this is to prepare students to become better teachers in whatever career that they go to. And it's a three-phase program First, you start out learning kind of the basic um, teaching strategies, evidence-based teaching strategies. Um, then there's a kind of a research phase where you research more yourself into these um, activities and you shadow um, people currently teaching. And the third is a kind of a practicum where you either teach alongside a professor or you develop your own course. And with that, I developed uh, actually and taught two courses and really enjoyed it. Um, but uh, I, I reached out, or I guess the Center for Educational Resources, the same um, organization reached out to us who had completed the teaching academy and said, you know, do you wanna do a TAR project? And um, that sounded really interesting. And especially because like Liz said, I was, wanted to get feedback. When I, was, when I had created these two courses, you know, I, I felt like I was teaching well, but I knew that I could improve, but I, I didn't really know the ways that I could improve. And so uh, I, I looked at this TAR approach um, and I thought it was a, a great thing to do. Like Liz said, you know, it, we are scientists, so we should continue to collect data and, and act on that. And, um, and so I, I kind of thought about this, you know, design cycle for my teaching where we teach we need to collect feedback and then I analyze that and make changes. And um, so that was kind of the motivation for me to do this TAR project is how could I improve my teaching? And one of the things that I had had feedback from before at the end of the semester was the final project that I had assigned and kind of how it was kind of bland comparison to the, the lecture content of the course. And so uh, what I did for my TAR project was I allowed non-traditional final projects. So I allowed students to either create a podcast a YouTube video, a traditional like report, or uh, like a science outreach demonstration uh, to, to demonstrate their learning of the concepts throughout the course. And uh, it was really interesting. I, I didn't really publish it. I presented it at Johns Hopkins, um, but I, it didn't really go much further than that. I think my, it was more of a training ex, uh, exercise of how to complete a, a TAR project and do some science in, in teaching rather than a, a rigorous publication of anything. Um, so it kind of helped train me. Uh, but one thing that it helped me realize also is that, you know, collecting this feedback usually only happens maybe once or twice in the semester through formal methods, right? A teacher evaluation or maybe a student showing up at office hours um, that gives you some sort of feedback. And so I wanted to enhance this process and, and make it go a lot faster. And so the next thing that kind of popped up through this organization was they had a Shark Tank event where they wanted innovations about education and technologies uh, that could be proposed and developed specifically for that. So what I proposed was development of uh, an app and I actually got some money to do that from the Shark Tank event. And so I developed this app called T-Crunch, which is basically kind of similar to what Liz described with the, the three by five cards, um, but in, in app form. So you create questions on this app um, that you want your students, they're linked up with your course, they see them pop up, 
they answer them and, and then they send them back and you have this real time analysis of what, what students uh, are, you know, what answers to whatever questions you have, you know, is it the muddiest point or, you know, how, how long did it take you on, on uh, doing your homework this last week? So this was uh, a long process, a lot longer than my TAR project actually took is making this app, developing it, working with instructors, seeing, seeing what they wanted seeing how it actually impacted learning. And um, it was great. And, and, uh, and I used actually the app throughout the rest of my teaching at Johns Hopkins. And then, then from there, you know, this, this kind of spiraled um, to a lot of different things. So uh, I didn't ever present my TAR at any conferences, but I did present this development of this app at, at a lot of conferences. So I, I presented it at a uh, biomedical engineering society meeting. I presented it at uh, the American Society for Engineering Education uh, conference. The, I was presented through the CERTL network several times. And then I actually published, it's not a, a formal publication, but it's through this innovative instructor um, publication series of, you know, what the technology was, how people could use it, um, and uh, etc. So this was, this was great. Um, I think these things were more for like my CV. It was also great, though, that I got connected with a lot of different people um, who are also interested in, you know, improving education in this similar concept of developing technologies for education. So, um, yeah, I, I think that that just each thing has led kind of to the, to the next to the next uh, level of interaction and the next um, expanded network of people that I, I can you know use to, to learn from and also give you know my contributions of what, what I when I'm learning with education and then um, from there I also got kind of recognized from from someone else within the biomedical engineering department who was in charge of the, the master's online program. And they asked if I wanted to develop a course uh, for, for that program. And so I've developed a, a course that I, te I teach and I've taught for the past three or four years um, called Immunoengineering. And uh, it was directly as a result of all this teaching research that started kind of from TAR. And uh, so definitely helps, like others have mentioned with, with the career path, and, and from there, I actually was able to work with these people that I've kind of interacted with and established a network to write an article about how we address some challenges with COVID in our online education system. And we got that published recently, um, early this year. And so, yeah, it, I, I think that in general, the TAR project teaches you how to think, you know, constructively of, you know, how to improve yourself little by little every time you teach um, so that you're a better teacher for students, but then also connects you with a network of people who are passionate about learning and education and um, opens doors to opportunities to see how you can make an impact or actually learn from others as well. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll just stop there. That's great, thanks so much, John. There's lots there to dig into. So I'm eager to get to the questions, but before we do that, I wanna hear from one more. Uh, Lindsay, Avery, it's all yours. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really excited to be here and to talk to you guys about a little bit about me and my journey um, and uh, through my academic career and how TAR has helped me. Okay, so my timeline here and my journey. So I got my bachelor's um, from a small uh, college in upstate New York called Utica College. Uh, it used to be a division of Syracuse University, but now it's, it's independent. So I had that sort of small college um, experience that I'm really grateful for. And it really um, gave me the support I needed uh, to get through that experience. I started grad school in 2012. And at the time I, um, 
I, I was at the, I went to the University of Pittsburgh in infectious disease and microbiology at the School of Public Health. And at the time I thought I'm gonna go and do some hardcore uh, infectious disease research, um, big suits, everything. Um, and then I started to get a little bit more realistic about where I saw my life going. Um, and I realized that I um, really should be able to teach as, as a PhD level scientist, but I didn't even uh, know what the word pedagogy meant. <laughs> and I found the opportunity to take a teaching course at the University of Pittsburgh, and it was through the CERTL network. And so I began my CERTL training with um, some formalized courses in 2015. And through that, I found a network of um, other people that were interested in teaching. And I got the opportunity to uh, start teaching an undergraduate laboratory course. And during that time, uh, before I finished my PhD, I got to do more CERTL courses, the laboratory teaching, and then also my TAR project, which I'll talk a little bit more about after. Uh, upon finishing uh, my PhD in 2018, I, I knew that I did not want to do, at this point now after having these experiences, um, which I really loved and, and the teaching, even with the lab courses, I knew I didn't want to pursue a traditional postdoc. Um, I wanted to have teaching an important part of my future and where I was going. And so I went on to only uh, apply to and search for the ERACTA funded postdoc that, um, that Liz had mentioned. And so I ended up at the University of Pennsylvania where I am right now in, in the Pennport uh, ERACTA postdoc. And this gives me the opportunity to do my, my research, but also funds me to do teaching at minority serving institutions in the Philadelphia area. Um, so I've had the opportunity to teach at community colleges um, and uh, like primarily um, commuter schools and students with low socioeconomic status. It's a really excellent um, program. So if, if that's something that any of you guys are interested in for a postdoc, I'm happy to talk more about that anytime. Um, and so throughout here, I've also been able to take some of the skills I learned in my TAR project and apply them uh, to how I approach my teaching. And, um, and, and like others have said, it really helps me think about uh, just being really intentional um, with how I teach and, um, and reflecting on, on what I've been able to, to do and how I wanna go forward. And so throughout this past year with everything else that's crazy and been happening in the world, I was also interviewing for assistant professor positions and I'm really excited to announce that I was successful and um, I'll be starting a tenure track assistant professor position at St. Michael's College in Burlington, Vermont, um, where I'll get the opportunity to do both teaching and, uh, and research. And, and that was really important for me. Thank you, Th uh, throughout the, the whole process is I, I was constantly reevaluating in my life. Um, do I want to leave research behind? Do I want to leave teaching behind and just pursue one or the other? And I never felt like I could really do that. Um, and so these programs along the way have really uh, allowed me to, to, to have the best of both worlds. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So a little bit more um, specific of, of, of the main point I want to make too is that you know time is linear, but but our journeys are not. So I know it makes it seem like everything kind of went along in the way, but there's lots of bumps in the road, lots of times that I've had to go back and and re reevaluate and re rethink about kind of what trajectory goes first. Lots and lots of failed interviews and no's and rejections, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't finally get there. So that's uh, just my word of encouragement from the other side. So my project um, focused on uh, an intervention to increase uh, accuracy and understanding in undergraduate pipette use. So uh, when I, during my CERTL um, courses, I got I met people who were teaching the CFAGES course at University of Pittsburgh. So for those of you who aren't sure, uh, haven't heard of this, this is um, a a lab where um, it is research-based lab, so freshmen come in, and instead of doing a kind of cookie cutter um, uh, laboratory experience, this is authentic research-based lab, and um, students get all of their protocols up front, and they spend the entire semester doing research um, on their individual phage. So a, a phage is a virus that can infect bacteria, so students come in the first day with a 
a handful of dirt and they're going to isolate their own individual bacteriophage and then do a sets of experiments throughout the semester on it. So they're never graded on kind of how far they make it through the protocol. Um, they're just graded on how well they keep their lab notebook and their ability to sort of think through all the problems that they have. Um, and from day one, these first year students need to be able to use a pipette. And that was a huge challenge. Most of these students had never had any experience um, doing that. And their accuracy in pipetting is, is really linked to their success in many of these experiments. So I wanted to design an intervention where I, um, could spend only one uh, class period time giving students sort of a rigorous um, approach to how the pipette works and get practice with it. So um, I was able, because I had already taught one semester of C-phages, I sort of had a, a before, and then I did the intervention in the second semester, and so I had an after, and then I evaluated how far students made it through the course using their, their lab notebooks. So I could kind of do it retrospectively too, which was really helpful. Um, and, and this was really, a really fun exercise and something that I continue to think about as I go forward. I was able to present it at um, the American Association of Immunologists meeting, as well as the uh, ERACTA uh, meeting, which is like a really great place uh, to get together with other people who are thinking about how um, how teaching uh, how we can improve our teaching. So along with uh, designing the intervention, which was of course a, the biggest learning experience, I also learned how to write an, an IRB and what that process looks like. I had no idea what that was like before. Um, of course, learning uh, the logistics about implementing the intervention, analyzing the results. That was something I uh, did not have experience with this type of data um, before, which was really, um, uh, unique and important for me to think about. And so finally, the, the big takeaways that I want to uh, talk to you about what I learned from completing the TAR project, really about evidence-based teaching and the education literature, things like I didn't know what pedagogy meant. I didn't know what Bloom's taxonomy meant, all of the acronyms that people talk about, I had no idea. And so once I actually got into the literature and learned about these, these are now words and acronyms that I used in my teaching statement when I applied to positions. And so, um, I would definitely suggest using them, but also citing them in your in your teaching statement. So that way, for those people who who aren't also familiar, they would know where to where to find what you mean. But it definitely shows that you are exposed to and interested in um, in the current uh, teaching styles. Uh, learned new analysis tools. Uh, like I said, different types of data. Um, you know, as a scientist working really in cell biology. Um, I'm used to very strict numbers and this was not that. I had to think about how do I get um, objective data from really subjective feelings. <laughs> um, so that was that was really good and interesting for me. Uh, and then of course networking, that's uh, you know uh, what others have touched on and meeting other people within the CERTL network is how I learned about ERACTA and and then getting into Iraq is how I meet those connections that, that have helped me uh, throughout my job search and, and be successful. So um, that's all I have for you guys today. So thank you very much. And um, I'm uh, excited to answer any of your questions as I'm sure the other panelists are. Wonderful. Thank you, Lindsay. That was a great, great uh, presentation and, and, and uh, some very interesting, interesting journey, steps on your journey. Uh, so, what I'd like to do is, yeah, let's stop screen sharing here so we can see each other. And this is just a time for people to really ask any kind of questions from the TR project to the career, how it impacted, how to approach, how to approach if you're starting out a TR project, how to take some of this into your, your initial designs or thinking about your project, kind of anything. So uh, what I'd encourage people, if you could raise your hand, uh, and then we'll and ask on the microphone. That's great. But if you prefer, we can you can put it in the chat and we can uh, take your question from there. So I'm going to give a few minutes for people to gather their thoughts and then some brave person, please start off the, the questioning. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to ask a question. 
Uh, my name is Yi Chen Yan. Uh, I'm currently uh, a third year PhD student at Indiana U University. Um, so I noticed that the uh, four panelists are uh, your background uh, had uh, less, less or no teaching um, experiences. And then through the uh, TAR project, and you learn a lot more um, teaching experiences and, and take you to your career path. Uh, for me, I'm on the opposite. I was a long time teacher. Uh, I've been teaching almost for 20 years um, in K-12, also higher education. Um, I'm wondering what's, what's your suggestions for, for people like me? I already had a lot of teaching experience and I'm currently teaching um, in, in the university as well. Um, what, what kind of suggestion you, you would provide that help me uh, taking me to my career path, which I, I still have very strong passion about teaching. Thank, Thank you, Chan. It's a great question. Any one of our panelists wanna jump in there? I, I, can, I can start us off. Uh, to be honest, I'm struggling to find something that I, that I could tell you. I feel like you should be telling us what we <laughs> Um, I think uh, the experience that you have is probably extremely valuable in the TAR sphere or te teaching as research sphere because you know exactly um, what students are struggling with. So identifying a project worth doing is probably going to be a lot easier for you than for uh, people who don't have any teaching experience. So uh, I'm, I know this is not a satisfying answer to your question, but I really, I can't think of anything that I could tell you that you probably don't already know. Um, as far as doing a TAR project, I think the only thing I would recommend is you probably have the experience you need to jump in. So um, just jump in and do it. I think, I think it'll be actually a lot easier for you than people who don't have experience teaching. Yeah, I think it'll largely depend on your goals. Um, there's a lot of things that I'm sure you can learn, like especially with like the analysis tools and thinking about maybe how to put this into publications, which would be excellent, you know, as a teacher and then being able to publish and it would be awesome um, to have that that chance. So uh, like I said, maybe the, like the IRB process was something I learned a lot about, the analysis tools. Um, so think about kind of your goals that you want that'll help you get to the next step in, in your career. Um, and what kind of new skills you can learn and use the TAR project to do that. Yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, everything that everyone said, I definitely agree with. And um, I think the TAR is set up that anyone at any level can get a lot out of it. And so like, maybe your project will just have a larger scope than say someone that doesn't have, you know, like us that we didn't have as much teaching experience going into it. Um, and yeah, maybe even just planning on publishing or being able to publish whatever you whatever you do for your project. Yeah, I, I will only add one more thing is that uh, one thing I didn't mention in my presentation that I think is really helpful is to align yourself with a mentor. And I think that, you know, even with all of your experience, there are people out there that you know, you can partner with regardless of their experience level that you can bounce ideas off of and get feedback on. And, and I think that that would be helpful for you, you know, going forward um, and, 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 and anybody as well. Thank you so much. Also, I also heard a number of our panelists talk about how after they got into their TR project, it helped them network and connect with other people and other projects or programs. And so I think there's a, a powerful force not only the project itself but who that puts you in contact with or what organizations or projects or opportunities come out of that so hopefully that that will be true for you uh rosana i see you have your hand up hi thank you for your presentation um i'm an assistant professor of practice at the university of nebraska and i'm starting to think about how to include TAR for my classes now that I'm actually <laughs> repeating classes. Um, so one of my concerns is about evaluation tools. I don't really know what would be the best evaluation tool or how to analyze data because I'm, I'm definitely um, used to other kind of data. 
So did you reach out? Do you recommend reaching out? Did you partner with anybody that were uh, the specialized in this kind of analysis and tools? Absolutely. Um, I used my learning community um, and brought it to the set of people through CERTL at, at Pitt and said, I have this data. Um, this is what I have. Let's think about, you know, these are my questions. What kind of data do you guys think would be useful and how to answer that? And, and some of the things were, weren't things that I intentionally collected, but things that I already had. So, you know, while some things might be obvious, definitely getting help and feedback on that will be critical to, to figure out um, how, to, how to approach that. Because you do want to have sort of the end in mind when you start, so that way you, you're collecting what you need. Uh, I would agree. I was, I think that's the advantage of having a learning community. All of the feedback that I got and all of the uh, learning of how to do, how, how to analyze the data came from uh, being part of the FAST fellowship community. Um, while now though, being, in a, being at, a, at a university and not being a graduate student, I recognize that sometimes ha not having that learning community can be difficult because uh, you don't have very many people to bounce ideas off of. Uh, one thing that I would look into if I were you, most schools now have something of this flavor is a center of teaching and learning uh, or something like that, where uh, most schools now, I think, have something along the li those lines where they are, where they have certain resources and certain people who can help you um, set up and run your, your um, teaching as research project. Um, so that would be something to look into if, if you haven't already done so in, in your um, university. I think, you know, and, and Rosanna, you, your question is a is a excellent one because for a lot, especially for STEM students, that often they get into these TR projects and dealing with qualitative data is not something that many of them have had, many of us, any of us have had experience with if in the STEM fields. And so all of a sudden there's this different kind of data. How do you even how do you even gather it effectively, much less how do you analyze it? So I really I second the the comments about turn to peers, turn to learning communities or ask other other folks because there's a lot a lot of help in that we can have in, in looking at the qualitative data. Um, I'm also just going to put a little pitch in that if you're interested, CERTL does have a uh, an alumni community and that has listserv and so sometimes people will and that the the people who've done who've gone through CERTL but are now at another stage in their career will kind of shoot out some you know questions to the group about that. So I will put Rob Linzenmeyer is the person who's who coordinates that. And I'm going to go ahead and put his email address in there. I don't think you'll mind if you do have a question about the, the sort of uh, alumni community. Robin, I hate to interrupt, but I can't seem to raise my hand. Oh, OK. Um, <laughs> Anne, why don't you go and then I'll see Tim. Tim, you'll be next. So I'm go sorry, ahead, I Anne. Keep, I keep clicking, and it's not letting me do that. Um, hey, no worries. So, so I do have a question. I also have been teaching for quite a while and um, am now teaching at a small community college. And I've been thinking about doing a TAR project and I've come up with several things that I see as problematic for students. But here's my concern and I'm not sure how to handle this. Um, so I'm kind of brainstorming what could you do to facilitate their learning particular concepts. So I teach biology. So things like cellular respiration or how to use a microscope to really see the cells to identify tissues because I teach human anatomy and physiology. So those kinds of things, but I'm concerned to come up with something that I think would improve their learning and only do it with some students. So I compare, so I can compare it with others to see if it benefits some students because I don't want to jeopardize all of them learning well. Does that make sense? So I, my understanding is to do a research project, I would need to have a control group and then a group where that I would allow this extra whatever I would do to facilitate that. And that bothers me. So I don't know if there's another way to think about it, um, but that's my question. One way is definitely to use your previous times you've already taught the course, um, like something else, that you, there's test scores or something like that. So use past, so that way you're not changing it. The other thing um, that I've done is ask a peer um, and who's teaching maybe the same level of course in you know a different section 
um, with, for if they want to collaborate and collect certain data that you know they're not interested in doing the intervention, and you know that that might be a, a good control group. Thanks. That's really helpful. <laughs> Other thoughts from our panelists, Cecile. So uh, I have had exactly this conversation with somebody last week because the teaching is research project that I am trying to do right now. Um, my, my way of saying it, which kind of is exactly what you just said, was I'm so convinced that the intervention is the only way to do things that it feels unethical having students do it any other way in order to test my theory, because I'm pretty convinced that that's how you, how you should be teaching it. Um, and I got kind of the same answer that, that Lindsay was saying, which is, uh, is there a way to compare to prior data? Now, for my case, that, that's not possible because um, I haven't I don't have a clean control group in that sense where they had no, um, no intervention whatsoever. They all had some kind of this uh, intervention that I'm thinking of. But um, another thing to consider, and then there's also the alternative of you publishing this as, a, as kind of like a neat thing that, to do in a classroom without really comparing to a control group, which I know makes all the scientists here cringe. Um, but there is that option that exists uh, that, where you could do that. Um, the thing that I think I'm going to do that might work for you, depending on what your uh, intervention is, is to sequence it so that uh, you kind of intervene once, see how they how re how they react to it, and then in a right before a different assessment, have them do a similar exercise where you don't prompt them to do your intervention and see if they do it and kind of use that. Now that's pretty specific to working with my type of question, so it might not apply to you, uh, but I just. Thought I'd throw that in in case sequencing helps you. Thanks, Cecile. I see Devin, you put a comment in the chat. Do you want to add anything to this, to the discussion? I guess what I would add, um, and pardon my video, I'm going to look like I'm underwater for a minute here, um, is that study design isn't trivial. And so it's it's really not a trivial question like what um, Asiel was mentioning. We could think crossover designs, but then you have to think of what's difficulty comparable between them. Did you have comparability between their familiarity with the course? Because of course we see things improve as students go through the trajectory of a course. So there's there's all sorts of things to consider when you start to ask comparative questions. But you don't have to ask a comparative question. You can start where your comparison is. Where did my students start? Where did they wind up? You can look at how that might compare to a prior cohort and then examine, well, were the students comparable though? Or how might the students or how might the instructor have been different between those cohorts? So it's a question of what level of rigor you want, but often for TAR projects, we're really looking for you to be able to say, hey, do, do I think this worked? And what level of data do you need for that? So depends. Thanks, Devin. Okay, Tim, you've been waiting patiently. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead, Tim. Sure, thank you all. Uh, I'm Tim Etzkorn. I'm a, a third year PhD student in English at Indiana University. Um, so coming, coming from a different perspective in terms of data, but my question I think uh, plays into, into this conversation right now. Um, and it's, I'm, I'm curious about measuring the efficacy of, of learning artifacts, especially uh, teaching today in this, you know, in this mostly digital mode. Um, so I see, I think my question directly relates maybe to John Hickey's project, but I'm sure all of you can speak to it. And I also see a lot of wisdom in what you just said, Devin, Devin Wixon. Um, but how, like, how can you measure efficacy for kind of isolated learning artifacts? If um, a lot of, like my research is in rhetoric and composition, which is deeply invested in pedagogy and uh, there's a lot of experimentation at IU with like um, hybrid synchronous asynchronous models and the asynchronous time gets filled in with these learning artifacts. So without those, without those controls, how can you assess what, like, what is this doing? Is this, is this moving the benchmark forward or what kind of data is good data to gather to reflect and assess uh, the efficacy of, of video, not just lectures, but like actual learning videos that work as isolated artifacts. Um, so aw awesome that you're you're thinking about this stuff and uh, a lot to unpack, I guess. I, I, I'll, I'll 
share my opinion, but I'm sure others will have uh, more insights. But I think that uh, whenever I was trying to figure out what to measure, I always kind of came back, my, or at least the person who was kind of like my mentor always pushed me to go back to what was I trying to accomplish with measuring for my project? Like what, what was like the, the end all goal? How do I want my students to be or to know or to think because I've made this change in my teaching? And so measuring that um, at the highest level and then you know figuring out subsets of, of things that that contribute to that was it helped narrow down my focus of like what to actually measure um i'm not sure if that makes sense or answers your question but um i'm sure others have things to pipe in for me it almost felt like i was starting over in research um, i remember when i first started doing research as an undergrad you want to answer all the questions the big questions you want to find something definitive and i had to really it's like writing your question and then saying okay be more specific and then writing another question and then thinking okay be more specific and you really have to drill down um and then ha you know having a mentor or a community that's going to help you figure out what those specific questions are are going to really help you narrow into what you want to measure and then what you want to change. And so something, you know, you're talking about the, the learning artifact, maybe it's a one video and maybe you link that video to a specific question on the exam and you just measure yes or no, did they get that question right? You know, something really simple and then kind of putting uh, more into that as you as you go along might, might be a, a way to break it down. Any other thoughts from panelists? Okay, I see we have a question from Amber. So Amber, go ahead. Sure, my question, I, I'm really interested in exploring sort of um, open educational resources and open andragogy or pedagogy. And I'm curious if folks have experience with that or advice to give, given that that sometimes makes it a little more challenging to have these um, comparables or um, a, a way to engage in that measurement discipline. Yeah, so I guess I can talk about that a little bit. Um, Emmanuel College in general is trying to move to more open education resources, which um, for us has typically been trying to find a textbook that is freely available to anyone online. Um, I looked, so I've been teaching kind of like intro to neuroscience for psychology students, psychology majors last semester. Um, and we looked into it heavily to try to find something. Um, but there's just nothing as good as like the paid textbooks at the moment for that specific area. Um, so I don't know about the like data part and like measuring part, but I would, you know, I started by looking at what are other people using for those open education resources. Um, and I think just thinking about that in general is good. Um, it kind of depends on what your goals are. Like, do you want to assess if the OER is better than like the traditional, then that may be different. Like it kind of depends on what you want to get out of it, but I think I would encourage anyone to try to move to any OER that you can use and and be at least for our students. Um, we kind of have a range of people from different financial um, you know, levels. And so trying to be more inclusive includes, you know, having being able to limit the, the cost of, of taking a class. I just moved my, I teach an online microbiology course for nurses and I just moved the textbook to an OpenStax um, textbook. I think it's, I think it's really, really important, um, you know, that we really focus, we know that higher education is so expensive. So if we can take any of that down and make things accessible, but I wonder if it's even worth um, just looking at students' opinions and their feelings around having open access um, materials. So even if you just survey them and get a feel for, you know, a before and after or sets of students that did or didn't know about um, a particular um, 
uh, open resource, it might be worth even something really subjective to get a good feel. And people want to know those things. If, if students are thinking more favorably about it, um, then they'll be more likely to use it. thinking even related to that, Lindsay, is that how does having an open educational resources, a course that's based in that, how might that change their perception of how welcoming the course is, or how much they belong, or how much that they see themselves in this discipline? You know, how, how does that change the invitation to learn? And even in courses where I teach with other people and we have to have a particular textbook, I, in my, in my syllabus, always put like an asterisk. If you have trouble affording, you know, this resource or have trouble obtaining this resource, please talk to me because um, we, we can help them find resources too. So, you know, for, for in situations when you don't have as much control over, over what resources you have. So, so appreciate all the great insight from the panelists and, and comments here, as well as the good questions. Are there any other questions here? Uh, I know I have one that I'm kind of sitting on, but before I jump in there, I want to just make sure that we have an opportunity for the rest of you to ask questions. Okay, well, I'll just jump in with mine and then we'll give one last so chance a, for the people. There's a question in the chat, oh. Robin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Estelle, I have a very basic question about TAR definition. When you guys say you apply a research approach to the teaching practice, what do you mean by research here? Is it that your research or general head research method? Is that is that your is that your research or is this a general pedagogical research method? So I'm wondering if people could say a little more about what they mean by the research approach to, to teaching. Yeah, so I guess for me, the like teaching as research in general, the project is to find something like people have been asking questions about like, oh, I'm interested in how open education resources is gonna, you know, affect my students. Um, think, thinking about some sort of question related to teaching or education um, and, you know, learning about the education literature um, and figuring out how you want to assess that and collecting data um, to ans specifically answer that question. And so I think for all the other panelists, I'm just going to speak for <laughs> everyone. Uh, you know, we we are not in the like education um, research space. Like we're all, um, you know, biology, engineering, um, neuroscience research, and so our like main research focus is something else. Um, but we want to apply the skills that we've learned through grad school and postdoc to um, our teaching to make sure that it's um, you know as as equitable and um, open to everyone. Yeah, and in some cases you can take like you a new pedagogical you know intervention that you learned about like think pair share and try it in a different setting. So in some cases we're taking you know what we know and then applying it, but you can you know take something else and apply it to a common misconception or um, any piece of it can be varied. And that's a great question, stuff. I agree with Devin here in the chat. Is that uh, it is actually a common misconception of TAR that it needs to, to have validity, it needs to be published, it needs to be a really substantial question, it needs to be kind of in the realm of education research. And our goal is absolutely not to take uh, other, you know, graduate students and postdocs and turn them into education researchers. That's not at all the goal of this. It's really much, much more modest. And, and as a lot of people spoke to it, it is sometimes about a kind of a, a mindset change, thinking about uh, a way of thinking about your teaching and a way of applying some of your skills to teaching, but it's it's more of a mindset shift as much as anything else sometimes. So you four kind of talked about a whole bunch of different ways that that the the TR project and process impacted your uh, career trajectory. You know, starting from kind of just changing your thoughts about what you wanted to do. Uh, opening up networking and other opportunities and, 
and one led to another that that impacted your career. Uh, certainly ways that that it, it helped you develop and sharpen your job materials or your job interviewing, um, helping you get the job. And then even after that, how it might have helped in the teaching after your after you get the job to start to think about your teaching. So I guess one question I've had, especially since about half of the people, over half the people in this group were just thinking about a, doing a TAR project. If you're at the very beginning of thinking about doing a TAR project, thinking about designing one, given all of these different ways that it, it can influence and, and leverage your career, do you have any advice for people at that early stage as they're thinking about the design or the approach to the TAR? how they can do it in a way, not only that it might be useful in terms of what they find, but it might be useful for them in terms of their career. It's a big question, but. Yeah, I would say, um, I guess I already mentioned it, but to find someone that you can really, you know, engage with as like a mentor or a collaborator, I think that that is really impactful um, can keep you going when things seemed like fuzzy or, you know, not really that important or interesting. And then the other thing I will say is just to choose something that you're really passionate about or can get behind um, that, you know, you're, the project doesn't have to necessarily be arbitrary. There's, there's millions of projects out there. And if you can get passionate behind something, then that's going to carry you, you know, far with the project, but beyond like, a given milestone of a publication or a conference proceeding, it's gonna take you your whole career, I think, um, a lot of these projects can. So uh, that, that, that those would be my two things. Thanks, Jen. I remember thinking, how am I going to do this and work on my PhD and do the teaching mm -hmm. and do everything else, right? And so, but if it's something that's, that really matters um, to you, it's worth holding yourself accountable using a mentor by yourself. And, and I had to break it up into semesters. So I said, okay, this semester, I am just going to think about it, put together my design, you know, think, think about the implementing, do all the thinking. Next semester, I'll actually collect all the data, right? And that can, that's actually the pretty easy part. And then I'll take another semester to, to um, analyze it, and put things together. And then the following semester is when I actually like presented it. So it took a long time for me because we're, I was also doing a thousand other things like all of us are. So don't feel like you have to get it done right away. Um, and, and the pressure is just coming from yourself, you know, not really from, from anywhere else. So I think that you can, you know, you can really get it done, take a bite size, you know, be kind to yourself and then and, and work on it when when you're able to. I think uh, the piece of advice that I would uh, give anybody who's starting off with a TAR project is to um, one, identify why you're doing it. Are you interested in the teaching is research aspect? Are you looking to learn more about what it means to be an educator? Are you looking to identify um, or to kind of learn more about things that you've identified in the classroom. I, I know my students struggle with this. I want to know why. Um, and then one thing that, that you should try to answer for yourself, for your own sake through this project is what do you want to do having learned what your um, opinion is on teaching uh, as research? Do you want to do teaching as research in your job later on? Um, if so, do you want all of your research to be in pedagogy? Do you want do you want some of your research to be in pedagogy and some of it to be in your discipline disciplinary work? Um, and then once you identify kind of how big of a chunk you want this to take up, I would say communicating that uh, with with you know kind of department heads or whoever you're interviewing is uh, with might actually be helpful um, to say you know I'm really interested in in teaching as research. I would like to do at least one um, in tenure track or at least one within the last with, within the next three years, something like that. Um, I think that would be helpful for your own sake, just so you know um, what you want, right? And if you decided, no, I just kind of did it to see, to identify a particular issue in the classroom, but I don't really need to do it again, or I'm just gonna do it on an ad hoc basis without any re like really wanting to publish or anything like that, um, that's fine too, but it's just something good to know about yourself. Yeah, I think I would just add like, you don't have to necessarily even do your TAR project. Like I feel like 
just thinking about it and coming up with a project and doing all that, like just in itself was really helpful. Um, like I know some some people that I was in like a community with, they didn't really have an opportunity to like implement their project. Um, they were more thinking about like, at some point when I teach this class or a class similar to this, like this is something that I would want to do. Um, so, you know, I think all of us have said that we've kind of presented stuff, um, presented on our projects, but I don't know that that's typical for um, a lot of people that take like the TAR class. Um, so I think just planning it in general is really helpful and, you know, reading the literature and thinking about these things I think can be really helpful. Um, and I think I mentioned that like the career, it didn't really like change my career, but it allowed me to be able to talk specifically about things in my job application materials. And I think that was really helpful. So, you know, even if you don't do your project or collect data, I mean, I kind of sat on my data for a while because, you know, a lot of other things um, and I pushed myself to analyze it kind of and present it and I haven't really touched it since then. Um, but I think just going through the process and even just thinking about how you would do it is, is really helpful. So don't, you know, think about the scope, but also think about like what you can accomplish. And, you know, even if you aren't able to do it, that's okay too. It's great on your CV, you ha usually have your research and your teaching, but now your research is divided up into discipline research and, and teaching research or education research. So adding that extra heading, it catches um, people's attention as you know, you're thinking about a lot of different, a lot of different things um, that is, is at least the feedback that I've gotten. Nice, nice tip. Any other questions from the, from the group here? Before we wrap up, any last last questions or thoughts? Amber, I'm assuming your hand is raised from earlier, right? Okay, no worries. Well, I just want to thank everybody for attending, and especially to thank our four panelists for presenting today. I really it was an interesting. We had a lot of interesting stories and things to say and, and some interesting questions and back and forth. So thank you so much for your time, the four of you, and for the rest of you for attending. Uh, we will be sending out a short two question evaluation just to, so we can get some feedback about how to, how to better uh, present and provide things that work for you all. So that'll be coming in your email shortly. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming and uh, hope you have a, have a good rest of your week. Thank you.